we, we see there, as I think you've explained, COVID at, at that stage at any rate wasn't even, you say, in the top five of, of concerns. But you go on to say, um, as I think you've just indicated, that officials at the DHSC were confident of the strength of the UK's pandemic preparations and the general view was that it was something that could be dealt with at departmental level. Does it follow that, at least at that stage, January, February, you weren't sort of worried about the priority that was or rather wasn't being given to COVID? I think in January, um, particularly early January, it felt like you know we were getting the balance right at the time. I think as we moved into late January and early February, I think you know it became clear that we we didn't particularly have that balance. But then it, I think it becomes, you know, this, the focus from what I saw yesterday was quite a lot on individuals. But I think the actual institutions, the organisations within the cabinet office and you know in the Department of Health, the feedback was. You know, we are well prepared to deal with this and things are in hand. The question of whether number 10 should have been kicking the tyres more and checking those issues if they were in place, I think is a valid one. But I think, you know, we were probably complacent to the fact that the work was being done elsewhere when, you know, obviously it was not. You refer to the fact that the Prime Minister at this stage was stressing the importance of not overreacting in the response, as something he said often resulted in greater damage than the initial threat and that he linked or likened COVID to past viruses such as swine flu. Is that something that he said more than once during that period? It was. I, th I think he was alive to the fact that previous um, health issues that had sort of taken hold, in, you know, in years gone by had proved to be sort of um, not as first anticipated. And I think he was worried about the government being swept up in a in a sort of media hysteria and overreacting and causing more harm than than he would otherwise. And I, again, I think that you know he has a certain colourful phrase of language sometimes, but I think it was right and proper that we were looking to provide challenge to, to you know to what potential options were at that point. The message seems to be that Mr. Johnson still doesn't think it's a big deal. He doesn't think anything can be done. His focus is elsewhere. He thinks it'll be like swine flu. He thinks his main danger is talking the economy into a slump. Now, you very fairly said a moment ago that in January, you, you didn't criticise the Prime Minister for thinking more about 5G, HS2, and so on. What about in early March? I think the Prime Minister was not alone in not doing as much as we should by early March, given the scale and the evidence that was uh, all over our TV screens uh, at the time. So, yes, the Prime Minister should have done more, but I think also you know, the team around him and across Whitehall should have done more. What about you? Did you think by early March it was a big deal or not? I, th I, think, so I think we all thought it was a significant challenge and something that was going to be you know, the only thing that we were focusing on for, for an, an awful long time. I think it was more of, you know, how and what should we be doing at that point? I don't think there was any clarity of purpose, any really serious outlined plan uh, to deal with COVID at that particular point. And I think that was the core failure was, you know, what were we supposed to do? You know, I'm, I'm not a, uh, an epidemiologist. I, you know, that's not what, what the expertise I would bring. I think, you know, there was a, a lack of clarity of what we should be doing at that point, really. I think it's fair to say you're quite dismissive of this plan in your statement, Mr Kane. Um, you, you refer to it, we can see about four or five lines down, as a, a swiftly prepared document um, published to provide some context to the options we had and the thinking behind our COVID response. Um, but then a few lines further down, you said... Many in government, including senior officials and politicians, that repeatedly referred to the action plan as the actual government plan to manage the pandemic. This was surprising, as the document had little detail and was clearly only useful as a communications device. Now, you, of course, were uh, the director of communications. At the time, in early March 2020, uh, did you see it as just a piece of PR, or, or did you think that it was actually the plan. I mean, I mean, anyone who reads the document, you know, will, 
we'll see that it's, it's not a it's not a plan to deal with COVID. If you you know that it it is a very thin overview of how we may manage the virus if you know if it progresses. I mean, we, we the first element of it was contain, and even by that point, I think contain was really off the table. So. You know, it, it, it just felt a strange document for people to refer to as an actual government plan at that particular time. And I think that was an area when, you know, um, quite a few people in number 10 were starting to get concerned because if this is the plan, then we clearly don't have a plan. Did, did you take a part in, in, in drafting that plan or the, the, the document? I'm sure I would have been involved in, you know, in discussions with it. I can't quite remember the depth of my involvement. So this is a, um, a, a text or a WhatsApp sent by Dominic Cummings to Boris Johnson um, on the 12th of March, so the Thursday of that week, uh, where he says, we've got big problems coming. Cab off. Cabin office is terrifyingly shit. No plans. Totally behind the pace. Me and Warner's and Lee Slacky are having to drive and direct. I take it that the Lee there is a, it's a reference to you. Yes. OK. Um, I don't think you received that WhatsApp, but do you remember during that week being one of those group of political advisers who were somehow having to drive and direct the government machine? Is that something you would normally expect to have to do? I think that the, the communication side drove a huge amount of the government machine during my entire time. Um, often, actually, in terms of looking at areas of policy, it's often um, comms colleagues that can find the holes and see where the problems are because you get an understanding of where journalists will look and where things might unravel. So you're often kicking the tyres. I felt in COVID more than anything, actually, there were periods when a lot of the policy was, was having to be drafted by or certainly shaped by communications professionals because there wasn't really anybody else doing it to any great level, which was a surprising thing to have to be de de dealing with from my side. I felt in COVID more than anything, actually, there were periods when a lot of the policy was, was having to be drafted by or certainly shaped by communications professionals because there wasn't really anybody else doing it to any great level, which was a surprising thing to have to be de de dealing with from my side. I want to press you a little bit, Mr Kane, about whether the extent to which you, you endorse what Mr Cummings was saying here. He's clearly saying, isn't he, that the reason that you and others are driving and directing is because those who should be doing it, that is the Cabinet Office, are not. Um, to use his words, they are terrifyingly shit. Do, to what it, I mean, do you agree with that? I might not quite use the same language, but you know, generally, yes. Let, let's look here, Mr. Ken. Look, let's not worry about the very top message, but second one down, there is a series of four messages from Dominic Cummings to you, and I think it's apparent that Mr. Cummings is in a, a meeting uh, with Boris Johnson and, and Rishi Sunak, uh, and he says, first of all, get in here. He's melting down. Uh, before I go on, let, let's just note the date. So it's the 19th of March. Um, so the, the, the Thursday of the week after that Saturday meeting that we were just discussing. Um, then he says, Rishi says, saying bond markets may not fund our debt, etc. He's back to Jaws mode, wank. What does he mean by that? The, P the PM at the time would refer to the... Um, the mayor of Jaws from the, from the film who wanted to keep the beaches open. Um, I think he had, a, he had a routine from previous in his career where he would use that as a joke from one of his um, sort of after-dinner speeches. But he sort of said, you know, there's more harm coming. The mayor was right all along um, to keep the beaches open because it would have been a long-term harm to the community. So it's a sort of reference to that. Did you regard it as your role to be thinking about communications across the UK or, or communications in England? Or did you not really think about the difference between those two things? I, th I think we would, you would broadly look at, you know, across the UK and, you know, that's where I think um, part of the work with Alex Aitken, who focused a lot more on the paid advertising, for example, where I think that 
you know, your, your, your paid media is slightly different from your earned media. The earned media we would have would focus prominently more on the Prime Minister in, and, um, and England, where the paid media would be more of a UK-wide approach, which Alex would lead and push through. The challenges, I assume, you're moving to actually become more about politics than communications quite often. And I think that's where the challenges in this space really came. Well, let, let's look um, at a document, Mr Kane. It's 214168, please. Uh, I know you've, you're familiar with this document. Mm. The context is, is it not, uh, that as the first lockdown was being eased, at least in England, uh, and the, um, the, the um, stay-at-home message that we were just discussing was being replaced in England mm. by the stay-alert message, um, there was pushback, um, at least from Scotland um, and, and Nicola Sturgeon's government, to say they didn't want that um, message um, to be used in Scotland because it didn't, in fact, reflect their public health decisions that, that they were taking in Scotland. Is that a fair summary? Correct. Um, and what we see here is, a, is a, an email um, responding, if you like, internally. So it's from Alex Aitken, who you've mentioned, to Martin Reynolds. But we can see your copied in on the, the response just above it. Um, describing this problem, uh, and if we cut down to the the headline, which is a point nine in bold, recommendation, brackets for ourselves, despite the objections from Scotland, run the campaign nationwide and work with the devolved administrations to deliver the most effective campaign and de-conflict if necessary. Was that what you understood yes. the, sort of the policy to be? Well, I, so there's different things. We're talking about the messaging and the policy. This is fundamentally a question of politics and policy in the sense of the devolved governments have been clear that they want to harder measures for a longer period of time um, while you know the, the UK the, sorry the you know the PM wants to lift measures and move into a slightly different stage that is a very difficult conflict I think for communicators generally when there's divergence in policy direction that does make life more difficult but the crux of it was about politics and about policy. It's not that difficult, is it? I mean, surely the <coughs> answer is, if the Scottish government, for example, wants to run one uh, type of message and the English or the UK government wants to run a different message in England, then you simply uh, don't buy the advertising space in Scottish newspapers. Uh, and if Mr Johnson is giving a, a press conference that's going to be broadcast throughout the UK, he makes it clear that the message is only uh, one for England. I mean, oh, is that I, difficult? I agree, and I think that sort of moves broadly into where we ended up with sort of regional spaces, but I think in terms of the... I think the PM at the time was concerned about the, the politics as well of the issue with a lot of pressure coming from the media at that point that, um, you know, the measures were too hard and they should be alleviated, and I think this was a starting point of some of that conversation. It's a reasonably lengthy exchange, although I hope to ask you about it fairly quickly, Mr Kane. It's an exchange between you and Mr Cummings and Mr Johnson um, on the uh, 23rd of August, so a week or two before that uh, WhatsApp we were just looking at. Um, and we can see it starting with Mr Cummings saying he doesn't think it's sustainable for GW. Who would that be? Uh, Gavin Williamson. I, so I was assuming not sustainable be. for Mr Williamson to stay at the Department for Education. Think Lee needs to brief a reshuffle after his SR summer recess? Uh, spending review. Spending review. Imagine. ASAP, get people in line, focus minds, and so on, talking about a reshuffle. Uh, he, he then repeats another message saying that it's going to be turbulent, but we need a path through it. Then a message from Boris Johnson saying he agrees, but it's fatal to it will be fatal to brief the Cabinet about the upcom upcoming reshuffle. And then a longer message from Dominic Cummings emphasising the position. And, and perhaps I'm going to ask you about this, giving us some clue as to the state of the government at the time. He says, it's a big mistake, don't sus not sustainable. If you don't get the Cabinet back into line, you'll have months more of the mayhem, briefing and leaking, 
This has seriously damaged your authority. You need to get this back. You need to read the Riot Act to the Cabinet and SW1. You should know there's a reshuffle coming between the spending review and Christmas. At the moment the bubble thinks you've taken your eye off the ball, you're happy to have useless fuck pigs in charge. They think that a vast amount of the chaotic news on the front pages is coming from number 10, when in fact it's coming from the cabinet who are feral, uh, and so on. And then in the last paragraph, I also must stress, I think leaving Hancock in post is a big mistake. He's a proven liar who nobody believes or should believe on anything. And we face going into autumn crisis with the cunt still in charge of the NHS still, therefore we'll be back around that cabinet table with him and Stevens bullshitting again in September. Hideous prospect. Uh, I'm going to come back to that, but, but let me just ask you about, we'll, we'll go to one or two other of these messages. I'm um, just going on. There's a series of, uh, of responses from Mr. Johnson talking about whether sacking people really solves things, um, quite what the timing of this uh, reshuffle should be. And then if you can look at the top of page 40, please. You um, contribute. You say, um, problem leakers, Hancock, Grant, Wallace, Truss. There are other second order ones, but these four have caused real problems this year. Uh, and then you say that you agree with the domestic policy agenda. We do need to up the firepower in key areas. Uh, whenever we do a reshuffle, it should be bold and filled with those you're convinced will deliver for you. So two questions, um, Mr. Kane. The impression created is of a, a number uh, of key cabinet ministers, whether because they're leakers or because Mr. Cummings has expressed such strong views about them, um, who, who weren't trusted as part of, of the government. I mean, choose your adjective. Is it chaos? Is it dysfunction? Um, help us understand whether things were really as bad as are painted in these messages. I think, you know, it's obviously a time of significant stress. And, you know, the, the, the challenges that we were dealing with are greater probably than any since, you know, 1945, which should, you know, it's important to highlight that context. I think government has a huge problem with leaking. I think, and it was really pronounced during COVID. You know, you're you're having conversations, you know, daily on potential options, and you would read about them in the next day, in you know, in various newspapers. And that, I think, from a messaging point of view, on public health, um, caused huge problems because people then want answers. Okay, what does this mean for me, my family, my lives? And you're then trying. You haven't got a policy developed, and you're trying to to sort of mop that up all and that was all the time we couldn't have a single conversation and I think that's because um, the sort of politics and the sort of knockabout um, view of sort of almost like politics as entertainment is is now so entrenched in the relationship between the media and with the government it's hard to to stop it and we, I think you know it's something you deal with as part of politics during Normal, normal days. I think in a crisis like this, it was one of the most difficult issues we faced was the constant leaking of stories. Uh, this is a, a, a text or WhatsApp um, between you and uh, sorry, between you and the Prime Minister. Uh, on the, we'll see the 15th of October. Um, he says, I must say, I've been slightly rocked by some of the data on COVID fatalities. The median age is 82 to 81 for men, 85 for women. That's above life expectancy, uh, so get COVID and live longer. Hardly anyone under 60 goes into hospital. I no longer buy all this NHS overwhelmed stuff. Folks, I think we may need to recalibrate. And you say, all understood, but how does this change the policy, still not politically viable, to change course? He says it shows we don't go for nationwide lockdown. Previously, we've talked about the economic arguments against lockdown. This seems to be introducing a slightly different theme. Uh, and I want to show you very briefly some other entries in Patrick Balance's diaries from around this time. Um, so could we look at them 
sequentially, please. First of all, it's, it's 273901. First of all, page 150. So this was a little bit earlier in August, where Patrick Balance has recorded that the PM WhatsApp group kicks off um, because, of some, because the PM had read about the uh, infection fatality rate. Um, and it says this, he's obsessed with older people accepting their fate and letting the young get on with life and the economy going. Quite a bonkers set of exchanges. If we can look at page 308, please. Uh, on a similar theme, um, picking it up a couple of lines down, PM says, his party thinks the whole thing is pathetic and COVID is just nature's way of dealing with old people and I'm not entirely sure I disagree with them. A lot of moderate people think it's a bit too much. And lastly, please, page 312. By this time we're in December. <coughs> we see the, the chief whip says, I think we should let the old people get it and protect others. PM says, a lot of my backbenchers think that, and I must say, I agree with them. Now, the theme in those notes is similar, is it not, to that WhatsApp we looked at between you and the Prime Minister. It's not saying that the economy is the main argument. It's related, but it's different. It's saying, look, it's only old people um, who get this disease. Why don't we just let them get it so the young people can live their lives? Is that something which you think uh, influenced the Prime Minister um, during this period? I think you know you could see from from the evidence that he was you know look, I think he was concerned about the damage on society as a whole, and he was trying to view it through that lens. I think some of the language is obviously um, not what I would have used, but for, for me the core argument was always the same, which was your choice is that we lock down and control the virus and we do so as quick as possible to minimise cost to health and cost to the economy at the same time. The only reason you can start having any of these conversations is if you have no intention of bringing in further suppression measures, which for me was always morally and politically you know, a non-starter. It was never something any responsible government or any responsible Prime Minister could or would undertake. The Prime Minister was becoming increasingly concerned about the impact of lockdowns on the economy and the political impact it was having on the right wing of the Conservative Party and the coverage of the right-leaning media. Um, for example, on May the 8th, 2020, the Daily Telegraph, a newspaper that had been robustly anti-lockdown, printed its front page on a favourable inter interview with the leader of the opposition. The Prime Minister called me that evening and expressed significant concern, stating our policies were causing us to lose the backing of generally supportive elements of the media, and he felt they may well be right. And then you add in brackets a position that conflicted with all the evidence available, those brackets. Yes? Yes. So can, just for clarity, um, what you are expressing there is a frustration that Mr Johnson's prioritisation of media views, um, he was prioritising that over the actual evidence, over the views of advisers such as yourself, and over public opinion at that time. Is that right? Um, so I think it's slightly more complex in the sense that he, I think, was unsure about the policy that we were... Uh, taken forward. So I think it was people reinforcing some of his own concerns. You know, I think he probably would, as I said before, been writing these sorts of leaders in the Telegraph himself. Um, this isn't a criticism of the Telegraph, which is, you know, shining a light on where they thought the issues were. Um, but I think, you know, the Prime Minister himself, this was part of his sort of oscillation and concerns um, yes. over policy development. Uh, the point I'm trying to um, get you to clarify really is that the point in, in the brackets that you seem to mm. uh, need to make clear that it conflicted with all of the evidence. So he's preferring the views of, of the right wing of his party uh, and the Daily Telegraph over the actual evidence and his advice. That, that's what you're conveying, isn't it? That's correct. 
The second topic, again, it's been touched upon, so um, I'll be brief, and it's about diversity. Um, and Mr O'Connor took you to, to deal with the lack of um, um, focus or consideration at all of split families and the Marcus Rashford issues. Um, but you say in your statement, and again, I'm not going to put it up, but it's a paragraph 121D, that some policy decisions slip through the cracks due to this lack of diversity. And you've already said, you've already referred to middle-aged and, and white people only in the room, and that's, that's the problem. What other, apart from the ones you've already mentioned, what other um, policy decisions slip through the cracks because of this lack of diversity? Um, I think part of the problem is, and I can't really sort of recall the specifics off the top of my head, but I think part of the problem is just very much having a situation where people's own lived experience isn't in the room. So, you know, if you have predominantly middle-aged white men, you're going to miss out on a whole load of different uh, areas of expertise and lived experience that will, you know. So again, like the Marcus Rashford was obviously a huge part of that. You know, some of the bubble sections, there'd be the sort of things that I would highlight. Um, 